How you doing? Good, good. Good to see you. Hope you all had a good Thanksgiving. And uh, how's it going back there in the production booth? Everyone going good? Everyone recording? The lights blinking, Brad? It's blinking? Okay, let's give a hand to the production team. Uh, normally, I direct the production team from the production booth, but since I'm speaking, you guys get some behind-the-scenes action today. Well, Merry Christmas season, everybody. Somehow it's Christmas season already. I don't know how that happened, but it's officially December. You're now allowed to play music without anyone yelling at you for it. How many of you are already playing Christmas music? Yep, yeah, yeah, there we go. There we go. Pastor Bill's got it. Well, I'm really excited, one, because it's, it's Christmas, and two, because I get to preach a Christmas message. I've never done that before. You know you've arrived as a minister when you get to preach a Christmas message. <laughs> Or at least that's what I'm choosing to tell myself anyway. Uh, the, if you need notes, there should be some notes in your worship guide. If you need an extra copy, raise your hand and the ushers will bring you some. The title of my message today, my Christmas theme message, is Peace on Earth. Peace on Earth. Uh, go, let's go to our theme verse for, the, for today. It's Luke 2.14. You've probably heard it before, but let's read it together. It says, it's in your notes and it's on the screen. Glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace. There you go. Goodwill towards men. You were already saying it. Peace on earth. We celebrate peace during Christmas time, don't we? We say it. We sing it. We proclaim it. When we th and when we think of peace, what we normally think of is the absence of conflict, right? Uh, like when in all the like Miss America pageants, when they ask them if they could have one thing, what's that one thing? They always say, world, gonna, peace. world peace, that's right. Uh, the absence of war and everyone lives at peace with one another. However, when we look at the world today, is that what we see? The absence of war, just peace everywhere. What about when we look at our own country? Is that what we see? Just peace, everyone's getting along, no conflict. What about when we look at the Christmas season? Is it just peace? If you go to the store, is everybody getting along per perfectly? You know, when I was little, Christmas was really peaceful. In fact, one year, uh, my parents outdid themselves. They got us a Super Nintendo. Any, oh yeah, any Super Nintendo fans in here? Oh yeah. I know you kids think you got it made with your Xbox 50 or whatever it is now, but Super Nintendo, that's where it was at. Okay. Man, that was peaceful, but eventually I became an adult, or at least I think I did. And I sat at the adult table. Did you know people fight during Christmas? <laughs> I, I thought it was weird too, but apparently it happens. In fact, sometimes it's like a war zone. You know, you, you got your family, your extended families coming in, and everyone's like, okay, hold this line, don't let anyone pass, make sure they don't go in that room. If they see what's in there, they're going to eat us alive for that. You know, no talking about politics over there. You know, it it's can be kind of conflicting sometimes. So obviously, that's not what Jesus was, was talking about, the absence of conflict. Okay, but he did bring peace on earth. He did. That's one of the reasons he came. He, didn't, he came to give us peace in the midst of a conflicted world. So no matter what's going on in the world around us, we can have peace. So... Uh, Today, I'm going to teach you how to get peace and what to do with it. So we're going to have three steps of peace, and it's going to start with your first fill in the blank in your notes. You're going to fill this in. Peace is accepted within. Peace is accepted within. Let's go to John 14, 27. It's in your notes, and it's also on the screen. It says, this is Jesus talking, Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you, not as the world gives, do I give to you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. Jesus gives you a peace that the world can't give you. Now, part of my job as campus minister is I go out on campus and I share the gospel with students out there. And it's great. I like doing it. And a technique that was taught to me uh, on how to gauge whether or not someone knows Jesus as their Lord and Savior because a lot of people think they do, but they really don't. So I was taught to ask them this question, and it's uh, similar to the question Pastor Bill asks at the end of each, each message. I asked them, if you were to die tonight on a scale of zero to 100%, how sure are you that you would go to heaven? 
with zero being you have no idea and 100% uh, being you know with absolute certainty. I get a lot of different answers, 20, 50, 75%. But if they don't answer with a solid 100%, then I know, then they don't know Jesus as their Lord and Savior. Uh, because if they do, if they are Christians, they will answer, yes, 100%, I know I'm going to heaven because I have Jesus as my Lord and Savior, and he's forgiven me of my sins. So if they don't answer that, I continue to share the gospel with them. Uh, Pastor Bill quotes this at the end of every service, 1 John 5.13, it's not on your screen, but he says, These things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God that you may have eternal life. You know that you have it. This is the true meaning of Christmas, guys. Yes, specifically, we're celebrating the birth of Jesus, but what we're really celebrating is what happened 33 years later. Uh, when Jesus died on the cross for our sins, he conquered death, hell, and the grave, rose again from the dead, bought us with his blood, prepared a place for us in heaven so that all who receive them as their Lord and Savior will receive the forgiveness of sins. And no matter how much turmoil and conflict is going on in the world around us, we know with 100% certainty that our future is safe and secure with him. Isn't that awesome? Isn't that peaceful? Isn't that peace on earth? Isn't that good news? If you heard me say that and you're not sure 100%, don't worry, I'll give you a chance at the end of the, the sermon. But that's great news. That's peace on earth. Now, if that wasn't good enough to, for God to give us peace about our distant future, he doesn't just stop there. God offers you peace here and now today. Let's look at Philippians 4.7. It says, and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. The peace of God that passes all understanding. Uh, now, you might say, uh, you know, the peace of God isn't just a head knowledge, right? There isn't the knowledge of, of the future, but it is the power to, of God to give you peace in all circumstances. Okay, it's available to you. Now, you might say, but Michael, I'm a Christian, and uh, I believe 100% I'm going to heaven. But I definitely don't have peace right now. In fact, I'm going through some really hard times, and I'm not doing okay at all. Don't worry, don't worry. You're, that, there's nothing wrong with you, okay? If you don't have peace, there's nothing wrong with you. Uh, that doesn't mean you're not a Christian. It just means you're alive on the planet today. It means you're just going through the process of living we all go through that. We all go through hard times, me included. Uh, but there is a solution. There is a solution to not having peace. You can have peace now, no matter what's going on. So let's go to Philippians 4.11. should be on the screen. It says, this is Paul speaking. No, it's not on the screen. Okay, you'll just have to listen to what I say. It says, not that I speak in regard to need. This is Paul speaking. Not that I speak in regard to need. For I have learned in whatever state I am to be content. Paul was saying that he is content or at peace at all times. Now, Paul's not insane and he's not ignoring bad things that happened to him. Paul had a lot of bad things happen to him. Uh, but what he's saying is he's making the choice. It's a choice. It was a choice for him and it's a choice for you. To accept that the power of God, the power of peace is inside of him and that God is going to take care of him no matter what, just like he has always done and just like he always will. Hasn't God always taken care of us before? Not let us go on. Isn't he going to keep doing it? So it's the choice to believe that God's not a liar and he's going to protect you. So the problem is we're, even though we have this awesome peace that passes all understanding living inside of us, if you have Jesus living inside of you, we're so accustomed to, uh, we're so accustomed to letting the, what's going on in the world dictate how we feel. Because there are good things going on in the world. It's not all bad. There's good things. But there's also bad things going on in the world. So if you let the world dictate you, you'll be happy, you'll be sad, you'll have peace, you won't have peace. But if you let the Holy Spirit, Jesus, dictate you, you'll have peace at all times. I can always tell if someone's letting the world dictate how they feel uh, by their social media posts. Okay. If you ever looked at someone's social media post and the top post is, praise God, thank you, Jesus, everything's going good, he's so blessed. Then the next post is, I hate everyone, everyone's stupid, this is terrible, leave me alone. <laughs> then a week later, something good happens. Oh, thank you, God, why does anyone doubt Jesus? He always takes care of us. 
couple of scripture posts, and then everyone's an idiot, leave me alone, I'm going to go live in the woods and never talk to anyone again. You ever seen that before? Don't raise your hand if you've ever done that before. Don't, don't, don't raise your hand if you do that. They're going like this, aren't they? They're happy, they're sad. They're happy, they're sad. They're, they're blessed. They're... But if you learn to accept the peace God has already given you, just like Paul did, and just like all the other great men and women of the Bible, instead of doing this, you'll be steady, steadfast. You'll always have peace. I know it's tough. It's tough to choose to be at peace when there's such turmoil going on around you. But peace has always been something we have to fight for, isn't it? Peace has always been one we have to fight for it. Thankfully, we're all on the same side, aren't we? We're all facing the same battle. We're all here to help each other. So I believe in you guys. I believe that you'll be able to have peace and victory in every area of life, not just in eternity, but here today. So that's your first fill in the blank, your first step. Now let's go to the second fill in the blank. So you got peace inside of you, right? Overwhelming peace. Now what do you do with it? What's the application of it? Fill this in. You can command peace onto others. You can command peace onto others. What am I saying here? Let's go to 1 Corinthians 1.3. Uh, this is Paul again talking. And if you don't know, Paul wrote most of the New Testament. The majority of the letters of the New Testament were written by Paul. Uh, 1 Corinthians is the first letter he wrote to a church. And this is how he decided to open it. He said, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Isn't that awesome? He opened his first letter by commanding peace onto the people he was talking to. Must have been important to him, right? Must have been really important to him because he does it in his second book too. 2 Corinthians 1, 2 says this. It doesn't even look like a change in it because it's the exact same thing. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Was important to him. He did the first two books of the Bible that he wrote. What do you think he said in the third book of the Bible that he wrote? It's, put out, it's the same thing. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. What do you think the fourth one is? And the fifth one. Actually, if you read every single book that Paul wrote, he always opens with this same sentence. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ except with uh, Timothy and Titus, where he adds mercy to it uh, because they were being commissioned as pastors, so he, he threw the word mercy in there. So it's obviously important to Paul to always command peace over people. I imagine Paul probably said this every time he walked into a room, every time he met someone, commanded peace over them, because Jesus did that too. Wasn't Jesus always going around commanding peace over people? He once commanded peace over a storm, and the storm stopped. Why are they always commanding peace? Because, just like everything God gives us, it's not meant to stay just with us. If God gives you peace, you're meant to give it out. If God gives you uh, happiness, love, finances, blessings, whatever it is, it's not bad to have it, but you're not supposed to keep it just to you. It's to be given out. You're supposed to have an overflow. So much of it, you've got to give it to somebody. So, did you know that? You can command the peace inside you onto others. And I have a story about one time God using me to do that. So, years ago, I used to be a zookeeper. I, I worked in a zoo. I worked in a zoo for 10 years. And it was great. Got to do a lot of cool things, a lot of cool animals, except there was one problem that I didn't know about until I got in there. It, the zoo field is probably one of the most difficult fields in the world to be a Christian in. It was just volatile towards Christians. Uh, I was a zookeeper for 10 years, met hundreds of zookeepers. We all, the zoos worked together. I could maybe, maybe count the number of Christians I met on one hand. You just didn't see them. They were volatile towards Christians. They spoke out about Christians. They made fun of Christianity every day. To my face, a lot of times, they would tell me, you're stupid for being a Christian. It was just really hard to be a Christian, so there's this whole immoral, immoral setting, and then there was me, little 17-year-old Michael, little 17-year-old homeschooled Michael. <laughs> I was homeschooled all the way to college, uh, so I, w I left a uh, Christian homeschool setting and got thrown straight into a setting that hates Christians. It was quite the, <laughs> quite the jump there. 
And on top of that, I was quiet. I had a lot of social anxiety back then. I had no social skills to be seen. And I was the only Bible-believing Christian in sight. I was an anomaly. They all thought I was so weird. Okay, I was more unique than any animals in those zoo. Okay, they... <laughs> I found out later that they all told their parents stories about me. Like, their parents would ask how that Michael boy is doing all the time. <laughs> so, this sets the stage for the story um, I'm about to tell you. So, I started out at the Santa Fe Zoo program. They have an amazing program there where students come from all over the world to learn to be zookeepers. And uh, so, there's anywhere, there's about 80 students at a time. You work at the zoo and you go to school there. So we all knew each other. Uh, you mostly stay with your class, but you knew everyone there. And unfortunately, something very terrible happened. It didn't happen at the zoo, but one of the students passed away. He had a heart attack while he's sleeping, and he didn't wake up that day. And he, he even had a wife that was in the program. So that morning, we were all at the zoo. I was there. And uh, obviously, he didn't show up. And they have an intercom system in the zoo, and they called out over the intercom, everyone come to the main classroom, stop what you're doing, everyone come in. They've never done that before, so we all piled into the classroom, not knowing what was going on. They gave us the announcement that one of our classmates passed away, and of course there was shock in the room, everyone was sad, people were, were crying. It's always hard when someone you knew is no longer there with you, and uh, one of his best friends was in the room, and that was the first she heard of it. And I still remember the sound she made. I've never heard someone make that sound before. So it was very sad, and then I'm sitting there, and uh, I hear the Holy Spirit, I hear God speak to me. And I didn't hear it with my ears. I heard it in my spirit, because that's usually where God speaks to you. But it was so clear, I might as well have heard it with my ears. This is probably one of the clearest I've ever heard God talk to me. So I was sitting there, and I heard God say, Michael, I need you to do something for me. And I said, what do you want me to do, God? I had an idea of what it was, and I wasn't exactly excited about it. Uh, God said, I need you to stand up in front of everyone and say a prayer right now. And I said, God, I don't want to do that. These people hate Christians. And they're mourning right now. You want me to stand up and pray in front of everybody? They're going to burn me at the stake for that. <laughs> I was sure they were going to kill me. Did you know it's okay to tell God how you feel? Yeah. You know God can handle it. You're not going to offend God. He's not going to get mad at you. Okay, it's okay to tell him, this is hard, God. I don't want to do this. And God understood. And the next thing I heard him say, he said, I know, Michael. I know. He said, but you have to. You're never going to get another chance like this. I heard it so clear. I didn't want to do it. My mind didn't want to do it. My body didn't even want to do it. My heart was pounding. My breath was slowing up. My arms were crunching. And I was having all the effects of a panic attack, basically. But thankfully, the Spirit of God was in me strong. And thank God I listened to my spirit. So I, I threw my hand up, and the teacher called on me. I walked up, and I whispered in his ear. I said, can I, can I say a prayer? He said, yeah, he gave me the four. I was like, great. <laughs> so I stood in front of everyone. And I said, I'm, I'm going to say a prayer. Believe it or not, they all bowed their heads. and They took their hats off. I said a prayer in front of the entire zoo animal technology program who previously hated Christians. I prayed. I don't remember what I said. I was terrified, but I said some things. But I remember specifically praying peace over the family, and peace over everyone in the room. And I made sure I sealed it, and I said, in Jesus' name I pray, amen. Then I quickly ran over and sat down and then <laughs> covered my face. I'm like, okay, time for them to kill me. They did not kill me. In fact, they did the opposite. They were so thankful that I did that. After we were released, everyone just kept running up to me. They were thanking me. They were shaking my hand. Some of them were hugging me. I said, thank you so much for doing that, Michael. So you're going to meet people in your lives that have been hurt by the devil. They've been hurt by people. They've believed lies about God. They've believed lies about themselves. That's why they seem to hate Christians. But when the power of God, when the peace of God comes out of you and on to them, they're going to recognize that. So the entire Santa Fe Zoo remembers that little, quiet, homeschool Christian boy 
standing up in front of them and praying the peace of God over everybody in the room, and they all felt the peace of God fall on them. Isn't that awesome? Isn't that great? And that's not, it's not specific to me, guys. I'm not Superman. I'm Michael. I'm not even the only Michael in this church. There's a lot of Michaels in this church. Nothing crazy special about me. I'm just a person. But in that moment, I happened to listen to the Holy Spirit. Okay, I happened to choose to be at peace. Remember, it's a choice. I could have chose to listen to what was going on in the room and just had no peace and be scared and hurt and crying like, a, like what was going on. But I chose to have peace. And God gave it to me and not just me, everyone in the room. But that hasn't always been the case, guys. There's been plenty of times where I heard the Holy Spirit talking to me and I knew what to do and I didn't do it for whatever reason. And I felt terrible afterwards. Has anyone ever been there before? Anyone that, like, see, look at all those hands. Guys, we're in this together. We all fight the same battle. We've all messed up. We've all heard God speak and didn't do it and felt terrible about it. But we're all in this together, aren't we? That's why we're the church. We're here to build each other up, not beat each other down. When someone falls, we, we pick them up. I want to be led by the Spirit at all times. Does anyone else here want to be led by the Spirit at all times? You, will you help me? Will you help each other? We're the church. We are the peacemakers. We have Jesus Christ living inside of us, the Prince of Peace, peace itself. So many of us are going to be going home this month to see our families. And I challenge you to command the peace of God over your families, to pray over your families. I know it can be hard. There can be a lot of fighting at Christmas sometimes. Sometimes it's rough. But if your family's not saved, if they don't have Jesus in their heart, you can't expect them to act like Jesus. Okay? So you, as the peacemaker of God, have the power to just pray over your family. Pray over your family time that God will minister to your family through that. And trust me, the power of God is much stronger than your weird Uncle Joey who talks way too much about Bigfoot and politics. That's oddly specific, but you get the, you, you get the point. You can command the peace of God. All right, time for your final fill-in-the-blank, the final step. And this is, this is the most important one. This is the one I want you guys to take home today. Uh, help others fill us in, choose the peace of Jesus. Help others choose the pre uh, peace of Jesus. Uh, go to Romans 10.15. It'll be on the screen. It's also in your notes. And, it sh and how shall they preach unless they are sent, as it is written... How beautiful are the feet of those who preach the gospel of what? Peace. Peace. Who bring glad tidings of good things. Beautiful are the feet. Everyone turn to your neighbor and say, you got some beautiful feet. You got some beautiful feet. Look at all these beautiful feet. Look at all these beautiful feet up here. Edmund, you got some beautiful feet. It's not weird. It's God. It's in the scripture, Edmund. It's not weird. <laughs> some beautiful feet preaching peace. Have you ever um, had a pastor or somebody pray over you and you felt so much peace while they were praying for you? You walked out that door feeling like a million bucks. But then later, shortly after, you didn't feel peace anymore. Ever had that happen before? Or maybe you went to a great worship service and you felt the peace of God like never before. You were worshiping, feeling peace, and then you walked out and you didn't feel peace anymore. You felt bad again. That's because you are feeding off of the peace of someone else. Someone else is commanding their peace onto you, but that's temporary because it's not yours. It's their peace, or rather the peace God has given them. Or maybe you know somebody who never can seem to have peace themselves, and they go from person to person draining that person of all their peace, taking all their time and their energy until the person can't handle it anymore, and then they move on to the next person. Ever known anyone like that before? The reason that is, one, they have no peace in themselves, but two, the reason the person feels so drained is because they are not meant to be anyone's source of peace. Okay? You are never meant to be someone's source of peace. Only Jesus can be a source of peace. And if we try to do what only Jesus can do, it won't go well with us. So yes, we can command peace onto others like I just taught you. But this is a tool, a means to the end. You command peace temporarily so the person can think properly, so they can feel the presence of God. But you take that opportunity to share the gospel of peace with them, the prince of peace, 
Jesus Christ, and then they accept Jesus into their heart, and now they have their own source of peace. They no longer need to feed off of others. They are now self-feeders. All right, so that's, that's the gospel of peace that it's talking about. The only way to truly have peace is to have Jesus inside of you. Yes, there are times where people need help. We all need help sometimes. We all need someone to lift us up. But when we lift someone up, we're not meant to keep them there, to keep them and say, I'm going to give you peace. No, we're not meant to do that. You lift them up, dust them off, and then push them forward. Okay, so let's look at our main scripture again, Luke, Luke 2.14. Again, let's read it again. Glory to God in the highest on earth, peace, goodwill towards men. We want world peace, don't we? Don't, don't we? The only way truly to have world peace is to bring Jesus to the world. Okay, that's how you get world peace. You bring Jesus to the world. So you say, well, I can't reach the whole world, Michael. But you start with your world. You have a world, right? You have people in your life. You have unsafe people in your life. Friends, family, co-workers. You know, a lot of people wish that they only had Christians in their life. Have you ever wished that all your coworkers were Christians? Ever, ever wanted that before? I used to wish that. Uh, now I'm a full-time minister and all my coworkers are Christians. And I love being a full-time minister. But you know what the weird thing is? I miss having unsaved coworkers. I do. Because I used to bring my coworkers to church all the time. And, you know, I go out on campus and I preach the gospel, and that's awesome, and God's going to use it. But when you have coworkers, they're forced to be with you. They have to listen to you talk. Okay, they have to form a bond with you. And you've got plenty of time to, to share the gospel with them. You say, well, I can't share the gospel. If you don't know how to share the gospel, just bring them to church. We've got people here trained to do that. That's the best way you can do it. And so... Uh, it was mu it's much easier to bring a coworker than it is for me to bring someone on campus because they have no reason to talk to me. They have no connection with me. Now God's going to use it, and God has used it. But man, when you've got unsaved coworkers, it's so easy to bring them to church. Now you might say, Michael, you, you don't know my coworkers. You know, I, used to, I was a manager of a zoo for a little while, and I used to do conflict resolution. I once had to do conflict resolution with two coworkers that got in a full-on yelling and crying meltdown over a container of baby food. I called it the Great Baby Food War. I know the coworkers you're talking about, okay? But remember that um, my zookeeping career I told you about how people just hated Christians. One time, and Pastor Mike is a witness to this. One time, I brought my entire workplace to church at once. Do you remember that, Pastor Mike? Yeah, he remembers that. They came in and they filled an entire row with people. Blew my mind. Okay, I'd been inviting people for years. They never came. One day, I was inviting someone and someone else in the room yelled, We'll all go! <laughs> and they all came! <laughs> that was my face. Okay! They came. I didn't do anything, guys. I didn't win an argument with them. I didn't convince them this is something they needed to do. No one's ever come to church or got saved because they lost an argument. Okay, all I did was pray and invite them, and one day the Holy Spirit came, uh, fell down on them, and they all just came. That's how it works, guys. God is stronger than people's disinterest in church. And uh, so now you might say, well, I'm, I'm scared. I don't want to do that, Michael. Well, maybe... Your mind and your body don't want to do that, but I can guarantee you the Holy Spirit inside you wants to do that. And right now, guys, we're in the Christmas season. This is the best time to invite someone to church. There are people who, who uh, would never normally come to church who will come to church during the Christmas season. So command peace into your body like I taught you. Make that choice. Pray and command peace to that coworker, to that family member. All right. When they come to church, you'll rejoice when you see them come. And when they raise their hand and get saved and get filled with peace and you see them get transformed, imagine how you're going to feel when you see that. Maybe you didn't preach the message. Maybe you didn't give the altar call, but the victory is yours. Last week, Pastor Bill gave us the numbers on how many people have gotten saved since we built this building. I can tell you most, if not all of them, came because one of you guys invited them. Pastor Bill didn't go out there and collect them all himself and bring them in. No, it was you guys. And I can tell you for sure in the college ministry, we've had some salvations in the last few months. I know for sure every single one of those salvations was brought by someone in the college group. 
brought by, brought by fa- friends. Because you guys are the ones that have the connection with them. So don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. The peace of God passes all understanding. will guard your hearts. Amen. Well, let's pray, guys. I, I want to do a special prayer. You're hearing me talk about peace and, and saying, telling you that you can invite people to church. And if everyone wants to close their eyes, if maybe you're afraid to, to invite someone to church or have peace, but you want the peace of God to fill you right now, would you go ahead and raise your hand and I'll pray a special prayer of peace over you. Yeah, I see those hands. Praise God. Lord, I pray over all these people right now who've got their hands raised, Father, that, that you would give a special blessing of peace on them, Father, that they would have the strength and have the, the peace of God to invite their friends and their family to church. I pray as they go through this Christmas season that they would have peace and not conflict with their family, that the Spirit of God would minister to their family and their friends who are visiting, and this would be the best Christmas season that they have ever had. In Jesus' name, we ask that in Jesus' name. So if we stay in attitude of prayer right now, I've got another question for you. It's the most important question anyone can ask you. Uh, I said it before, do you know for sure with 100% uh, certainty that if you died tonight, you would go to heaven? Now you might say, I think so, hope so, not sure. How can anyone know for sure? Well, the Bible says you can know for sure. We read the scripture earlier. I write these things to you, little children, that those who believe in the name of God shall know that they have eternal life. What does that mean? Someone asked Jesus that. He said, you must be born again. That means there comes a time in your life where you invite Jesus to live in your heart, ask him to forgive you of your sins, and he makes you into a new person. So if you've never done that before, you can't say 100%, I know I'm going to heaven. In just a second, I'm going to ask you to raise your hand and I'm going to lead you in a prayer. But maybe you've done that before. And you know right now you don't know 100% if you go to heaven. That's too great a chance to leave to chance, too great an outcome to leave to chance. So I'm going to ask you at the same time to raise your hand and I'm going to lead you in a prayer. No one's going to be looking around and we're all going to pray it with you. All right, every head bowed, every eye closed. If either of those two apply to you, you want to give your life to Christ for the first time or you want to rededicate your life, go ahead and raise your hand right now. Raise them up high so I can see them. Thank you. Anybody else? Anybody else? A couple more seconds. All right, let's uh, lead these who've raised their hand in a prayer and let's all pray it with them. Repeat after me. Dear Lord Jesus, I believe in my heart that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and that he died on the cross for my sins and God raised him from the dead. Lord Jesus, I ask you to forgive my sins, live in my heart, and make me into a new person. Be my Lord and Savior. Jesus, right now, I'm born again. I'm saved. I'm a Christian. I'm going to heaven. Thank you, Jesus. Jesus is my Lord. Give the Lord praise. People just got born again and birthed into the kingdom of God. What a great.